what Nakiran will do is he will take you through the main points of some of those readings, which you can read later. And at the end, uh, based on your um, responses <coughs> on Moodle yesterday, um, me and Prashant think it's crucial that you get some sense of what's the difference between royalist evaluation and ethnography. So we'll end with Prashant basically sort of telling you what are the main differences between the two things. Good morning, everyone. I thought Sureka is going to give me an entire one hour to me. No. Let's just give me 11 minutes to me. Uh, I feel like crying like a small baby. Uh, four or five points I want to make. One is enjoyed teaching yesterday. I don't know whether you enjoyed or not, whether Sureka agreed or not. I personally enjoyed and uh, I get very few minutes to, few hours to teach pure social science. These are few opportunities. and. Uh, three, four papers uh, were supposed to be essential reading. I will tell, strongly recommend, please read at least one paper, Helen Lambert's paper. Okay, Helen Lambert's paper, Helen Lambert and Christopher uh, McWheat. It's like a poem, okay, it's a beautiful paper. And I believe that she's one of the very strong, very strong and uh, tough mentor to work with. I've been aspiring to work with this person. I, I'm looking forward for an opportunity to work for the person. And the, this paper is about uh, differentiating qualitative research and ethnography. Okay, uh, many of us, uh, of course, some of us still dabbling or having trouble in getting understanding what is qualitative research, and within that, ethnography is a hu huge difference. There's a huge difference. I think there's a difference between quantitative and qualitative. That is as much difference between qualitative and ethnographic research. Okay. Um, that's why we also have had problems of some of the papers uh, which we had problem of whether defining it as ethnographic research or qualitative research for genuine doubts, I'm sure. And uh, Helen Lambert has four points she makes. I'll start with the last point, which is relevant to the idea of absenteeism. Did you think the word, why it's called absenteeism ending with ISM? It's a, it's a suffix, okay, which has an origin. Okay, it's a kind of labeling. They have Marxism, feminism, alcoholism, absent. Why should it be labeled? Okay, so I, I will like to start questioning this word. Um, what does it mean? What is the meaning of a person who is consistently abstaining from his work, her work? Okay. Um, so what she says is, um, I don't think I can say better than what she has written. A particular way that anthropology achieves this is by focus on classification and meaning. Um, by questioning the nature and boundaries of, questioning nature and boundaries of apparently basic categories. Okay, like we want anthropology wants to question every basic category. So, okay, nothing is taken for granted. Take it family, take it religion, medicine absenteeism, every category is questioned. The fact is because these categories spread across the entire space and time of human society has multiple configurations, multiple avatars. Okay? Therefore, the definition which is given by one person sitting in Europe or India may not fit the definition of person living in somewhere else. Okay? Therefore, every category has to be broken and redefined. Okay, and understood from the specific context, as uh, the context of space, space and time, not a only micro context. Okay, so therefore meaning, the, what I, meaning therefore is derived in that manner. Okay, so it is not only about like you take absenteeism and understanding why, what are the reasons people absent from. Uh, what can promote absenteeism, etc. But what is also their meaning of absenteeism? So the, what she says is, uh, a, a problem A, not only look at what are the beliefs and practice around the problem A or phenomenon A, but also to read, define and recheck the boundaries of this phenomenon called A, okay, X or Y. Okay? So that is very important point of questioning the boundaries of the definitions which are assumed to be taken for granted. Okay? So that's an anthropological approach rather than taking a phenomenon X or Y as given 
and investigating views of views of or beliefs about it also investigates the form and content of the the phenomenon x and y okay form and content of the phenomenon x and y and i'll add the word boundaries to that okay <coughs> so the title of the, the paragraph is questioning categories okay so that is one important thing and this also i took scientific temper of anthropological approach where you question everything which is taken for granted okay I mean that is where we were studying one's own society, somebody writing about TISS. So, it is not about journalistic writing, but you question also values of student life, of faculty life, research temper, etcetera and make it uh, that you, you have some purpose behind the utilitarian purpose behind that. I mean there is a beautiful book on men in white, on uh, the cultures of medical students culture, with a beautiful anthropographic work on students culture, lingos in uh, within medical college. Okay. So, it is not, it is I mean I will come to that point little later about what is research, who can decide what is research, who has the power to decide what is research. <coughs> what is so, that is one thing. Second is um, context and specific, context specific and comparative evidence. So, what it, the, or the, what the uh, ethnography offers is by, by offering specific examples, specific instances of how marriage is defined, how absenteeism defined how healthcare is defined, how patient quality is defined in different societies, it brings into one corpus of knowledge. Therefore, you have broader scope to generalize what you mean by say quality of service, satisfaction, absenteeism, marriage, divorce, whatever concept. So, so this kind of specific information, if can summarize and put in a corpus, therefore, you have a larger scope to generalize your statement. Okay? So, that is about the paragraph she talks about context specific and comparative evidence. Okay, so, we are not just happy with um, s describing a particular phenomenon in a, in a context A. Okay, an applied context, this context, th that is what we use the word transferability of a particular study of ethnographic work. Okay. And the third point she says is, uh, I am coming reverse actually, action speaks as loud as words. Okay, this is what we said. Uh, words can be deceiving, words is insufficient way of capturing uh, human behavior. Therefore, action is important, observing action is important. Therefore, important of participant observation becomes very, very important. Okay. Um, so, even if participant observation is not possible, if you do an interview, that interview has to be located in a specific transaction environment which it happened. So, do not represent as, as if you observed it. Okay, she actually, in fact, three, uh, she used three very important words. Okay, what the difference between qualitative and ethnographic work is. Uh, qualitative health research often fails to distinguish between normative statements, what people say should be the case, okay, desirable, often re responses are like this, and narrative reconstruction of the past and what is actually happening. Okay, so, uh, normative satisfaction, narrative reconstruction and actual practice. So, actual practice is observable only by participant observation, not only observation, more importantly participant observation where people are normal in front of you. Okay? And that is much more valid statement than a reconstruction of the past behavior and much more valid than the normative statement of yes I do, I do not do, etcetera. Okay? So, this is very important where the importance of validity of evidence flowing from ethnographic data. The, 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 the first point and here the last point is our knowledge and their beliefs. Okay, I think this is very, very important point. I think this is one of the fun underlying value of ethnography and it comes from our hints at the very important point of reflexivity. Okay. Now, what is reflexivity is basically it is a kind of Newton's third law where every action has a reaction. So, our presence in the field has a reaction no matter how much you are rapo, etc. Therefore, the, re the researchers uh, process of doing research, collecting data, talking to people, building rapo will ultimately decide how the knowledge gets generated and produce how the ethnography gets into shape. Okay? Therefore, it is important for the person to reflect on, ethnographer to reflect on what is he, who is he, who is she, okay? what is his social position, what does he, what does she represent? So, what does she represent? She could represent being a particular caste, being a particular economic group, 
a particular uh, academic training, so on and so forth. But more importantly, she also represents a scientific form of knowledge. Okay? She represents a science, scientific knowledge as against common knowledge, common sense, which is people give you. Okay? And very important is scientific knowledge is one of the forms of knowledge, not any more privileged over any other forms of knowledge, including common sense. Okay? So we have four different, four different varieties of explanation to a particular process, one given by community A, community B, community C, and one given by scientific community. Okay? So everything is equal. This is only one plus one, two, three, four. So it's not like one and they. So scientific explanation is only one of the explanations among many explanations. Okay? So this, this is, I think, the important to sort of uh, question the privilege enjoyed by scientific interpretation rather than or in, at the expense of common sense explanation is very important to sort of question this power boundary. So when I say talk of power, it's not only power of money and uh, English and etc., but power of scientific backing I have when I go into the field. Okay? So this has to be reconstructed in our body, in our mind that yes, I have a scientific background, but this is only my view, one of the views, but what is the view that have that view has equal weightage in my interpretation, my, my narration, my writing. Okay? So that, that, that is very, very important because science we we'll like it or not, we have to somehow we have to uh, uh, at least reflect on the fact that science is also a product of knowledge or a particular history. Okay, if you take Greek writings, the word science is not there. Science or natural science, study of nature, was part of broader concept called philosophy. So philosophy, study of philosophy included study of logic, logic, study of nature, and study of morals. Okay. So nature was, grew larger and larger and became science. Now science in, includes philosophy. Okay, as philosophy becomes a very small part of science. So science is also a product of human evolution and a particular point of time, it came with power of certain societies, wealth of certain societies. Those of you have followed the debate of India, allopathic medicine, Western, med, Western medicine and homeopathic medicine, allopathic medicine, know how the Western medicine enjoyed the state patronage, patronage of wealth and patronage of state, and therefore it became powerful. Okay, therefore, science is also a form of a knowledge which has to be questioned. I am not saying we throw away entire science and scientific error, but also it is important to understand science is a form of knowledge. It grew at a particular point of time and it cannot be privileged over other forms of knowledge if you want to go understand people's perspectives, people's knowledge. Okay, so when you say what is research, I mean I don't want to say if research A is not research. I don't want to be the custodian of that, that right to say this is not research. A ethics committee may say, uh, institutional uh, technical review committee may say it is not research. Okay, they may say because of their guidelines. But at the, at the larger level, what is research, what is not research, I don't think I have the power to say it is research, not research. Because if you look at, look at history books. Do you think they are not science? What, what, do the, what research they do? Okay, look at philosophical writings. You look at even Amartya Sen's book on justice. Lot of things comes from introspections. Okay, I don't think he went for a evidence based write, thing to write a book on justice. Okay? So what is science has to be questioned for us if we want to be clearly be a good scientist. Right? That criticism is very, very important. Okay? I think I've overshot by one, uh, two minutes. I'll stop here. Thank you. I think the ethnography people have really deepened uh, my understanding also as I listen to them on people and worldviews and <coughs> behavior and why things tend to happen in a certain way. Um, so I just wanted to very briefly reflect on what does this mean for uh, realist evaluation, realist inquiry. So I had just a few things that I jotted down which came to my mind. Um, one is uh, one is of what Sureka mentioned of going beyond health. I think uh, a lot of work has happened. I think in general public health has sort of 
evolved in a vacuum because it's sort of mother discipline is uh, medicine. Um, lot of stuff comes from medicine. So we have to a certain extent uh, uh, restricted our boundaries to medical sciences, biological sciences, etc. But a lot of other things like performance, um, management, leadership, uh, uh, attrition, or frustration, job satisfaction, these have been researched for decades and much earlier even, 20s, 30s, etc. Why do, pe why do people behave bureaucracies, hierarchies, etc. So there's a lot of body of knowledge out there. We need not necessarily just pick the thing and then match it to health. But it's like, like both of them were saying, it's very uh, important to delve outside. It's the same for realist inquiry. It's extremely important when we are asking why does something work here and not there, to borrow from uh, the disciplines which have looked at human behavior, cognition, organizational sciences, psychology, etc. Yeah, that's that's one thing. Going beyond health, I think, is a common lesson for ethnography and me. The points I'm making is not to really give you a difference between realist and ethnography because I don't myself. I have only read about ethnography. I have not practiced it, so I do not know. To some extent. In my own uh, PhD work, uh, there was scope for doing ethnography, and I have actually done it, but I have not described it as such, I think. Um, second thing is, uh, from a realist perspective, um, I think that's where the positivism comes up, is this focus on mechanism, on how uh, in realist inquiry there is this heavy focus on mechanism. Why? Why is it that people behave uh, what is it about people that makes them behave in a certain way? There are commonalities, uh, but our primary intention when we go into the question is about the mechanism which drives uh, human behavior. Uh, correct me if I am wrong, that's not the primary intention of the uh, ethnographic work because they are looking much more at worldviews and what's being constructed in this uh, reality. You know? what, what kind of a reality are, uh, emerges when I go deeply into understanding this setting. So that's that's one uh, uh, thing to, some distinction to remember. Uh, and both have philosophical underpinnings. I think that's what uh, Nathiran's uh, previous, uh, one of the messages from his previous uh, submission was, which is that it's not a method, it's much deeper. Same with realist inquiry and the same with it. ethnographic method, you could look at it as a method, but it's much deeper. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a way that you uh, you believe that people and societies uh, operate. It's similar with realist inquiry. So um, from what I gather, the ethnographic worldview is much, much more relativist, where knowledge is constructed by people's experiences and uh, worldviews. Whereas in the realist world, I was trying to make that distinction, that whole ontology, epistemology thing, you remember? <coughs> We also agree that knowledge construction is relativist, which is why we would uh, we could use a variety of qualitative approaches, even ethnographic approaches. But the effort is that in the realist inquiry is to say there is something deeper, the mechanism, the something that explains a, a sort of a middle range theory which explains all of these settings. So that is one distinction. It's not. I'm not saying it's an advantage. Remember, it's a distinction. It's a, the difference between the two uh, approaches. Um, that's I, I'll keep it at that. Let's not make it too heavy. But just to say that uh, um, going back to the questions is very useful. And secondly, we need not get restricted by okay, is it ethnography lens? Is it realist evaluation lens? Is it an economic lens? Rather, we can know that all these various lenses <coughs> offer these options. And how do I uh, sort of broaden my question sometimes? Um, and how do I become aware that there are these various other possibilities? It's not always an experimental setup that I have to look at uh, my evaluation or my uh, health problem with. It's not always an experimental setup. There are these various other positions available. Yeah? One more point, Helen <coughs> Lambert. First, <coughs> first point, very important. I don't think I'll have time to cover that, but please read the first point of this, which I didn't cover, <coughs> where she makes a distinction between qualitative research and ethnography. What is wrong with qualitative research? <coughs> I think the point, uh, see, there is um, uh, the research in academia cannot uh, encroach on all fields. 
it's not encroach on practice, it's not encroach on legalities, law, in, that's not the uh, mandate or even the uh, right of academia on research. Okay? Uh, but uh, having said that, it is also important to question those process of making guidelines and the guidelines itself. It doesn't mean that we should throw away guidelines, but what is the process of making the guidelines? And what is the guideline? Whether the guideline is um, the right guidelines. For example, we talk about the ICD-10, okay, the uh, international classical diseases, okay, and it looks very scientific. But we also know there is a lot of politics behind what disease becomes categorized important and subcategorized less important. So guideline making is also politics. Okay, it, it, I mean I don't want to take anything as very value neutral process in uh, social life. Okay, so ultimately if a guideline becomes more rigorous by this debate, it's great. But I understand in this process there will be also a process of subverting the process of making guidelines and end up having not guideline which is unfortunate. I don't agree with that situation. But I do agree by being critical of making the guidelines. Guideline cannot be just made with three, four people. Just be certainly uh, a, a, a participatory process, a, a scientifically rigorous process. For example, you look at NH National Health Policy 2015 draft, for, put it on the website of Government of India, Minister of Health. We don't know who made this policy. It doesn't even look like a policy. So we, by, as an as a activist group, as a public health group, I think we have to question the process which went behind the policy. Not only the policy, but who has who has put this health policy with so many people have been working in health policy in the field in, for, for four decades, five decades, six decades, and suddenly you see something popping up in the website saying the health policy. I think it's important to be critical of the process behind making guidelines, making uh, protocols, making policies. I think it will add criticality. I do agree that it should not lead to the subversion of the whole process of making the guideline and arriving at a guideline which is going to be useful for large number of people and uh, making uh, practice also uh, foolproof, practice also legally enforceable. I, I agree there is a need for guidelines. Okay? At the same time, there is a need for criticality of process, of process which goes into guideline making. And, and there, I think ethnography and uh, research, every, every research, uh, research as a whole, I mean, not only ethnographic research, even medical research people will question those guidelines and process of making the guidelines. 